Alrighty, bonjour et bienvenue tout le monde on behalf of Fourth Space and the new initiative. Welcome to Black Community Health Check. We are streaming on YouTube live from Concordia University's Fourth Space, located on unceded indigenous lands in Chichaga, Montreal. Nous reconnaissons la nation Kanyankahaga comme gardienne des terres et des eaux sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui. And we make this acknowledgement to bring awareness and understanding of the history of indigenous peoples and their territories and as a call to rethink one's own relationship uh, with the city, the land, and environment. At Four Space, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we collaborate with our university community to bring people together around the various initiatives, dialogues, and projects that are in development across the university. So to that end, it's been our absolute pleasure to have collaborated with Annick Mujid Flavien to host this week's series of events focused on Black community health. We're so excited to have Marianne Lopez back in force space with Anique. So without further delay, over to you both. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for that intro, Anna. Um, I just want to start by taking a moment for the National Truth and Reconciliation Day. Um, yeah, let's just have a moment together. So this week, we've been having conversations around Black community health. Um, the, my own personal investment in this conversation is because of my PhD, and I, I'm looking at um, Black community health, particularly with a focus on caregiving and the role that it um, plays in kind of facilitating our access to, to healthy lifestyles, healthcare, and so on and so on forth. And I have been bringing in um, experts to talk about the different areas in which black community health exists, right? So whether that be in health institutions, in homes, in community, and so on and so forth. And you've done so much work in community, so I'm really excited to have you here today, Marlene. Um, I'm just going to read your bio to start us off. Marlene Lopez is a black feminist community organizer tackling issues around anti-blackness, gender-based violence, and its inter intersections. She coordinated the EDI a Division of the Quebec Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers, where she did advocacy work and raises awareness on how gender, race, class, and ability intersect with the context of sexual violence. She has also organized with movements such as Black Lives Matter around issues such as racial profiling and um, police brutality. She was uh, vice pre president for La Fédération des Femmes du Québec and is currently program and outreach coordinator at the Simone de Beaufort Institute. And she is also the co-founding member of the Coalition to Defund the Police based in Montreal. Um, also happens to be a sister from another mister for me. <laughs> so, so happy to have you here today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the community advocacy work that you're doing right now? Um, I know that you have had such a long history of different types of community work, whether that be you know, around so sexual vice, violence, um, rape crisis centers, but also defunding the police. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on? Like, where's your focus these days and kind of what brought you to this path of community advocacy? Thank you, Anik. So recently I've been doing a lot of work around organizing uh, against sexual violence in terms of prevention, but also around organizing against policing and um, police um, presence in schools and elsewhere. And so a lot of times those two intersect because in terms of the work that I do around um, prevention, um, preventing sexual violence, um, we're working with folks that are trying to reimagine prevention um, in terms of not centering carceral or punishment um, when trying to do popular education and um, raise awareness around vul you know, what makes folks vulnerable to sexual violence and how to prevent it. Mm. I'm... I love that, you know, so much of your work is around prevention, um, education, and, and kind of changing systems in which we, uh, we work in, really. And not just at institutional levels, but I think that you do a lot of really interesting grassroots thinking about uh, where we're at and what we actually have as resources within our communities in order to be able to do that um, building up work. When I was thinking about the 
what I would call this week of, of conversations. And I and the, came up with the term, you know, black community health as like a, um, the term to work, work around. It was really interesting because, you know, all of those words are very um, contested, right? Like there's so many definitions of what black means. There's so many definitions of like what health means. And then of course, of what community means. And I would love for you to kind of um, guide us in what your understanding of community is, because I feel like it's a very, um, like your vision of that is really important in the type of work that we want to do if we're thinking about black community health as like a local or even global issue. So there's a lot of parts to that question, <laughs> but let me just try to address some of them. So for me, like I'm a migrant here in Quebec, Jojagi, Montreal. Um, and so I come from the Caribbean. So for me, community means something totally different than what a lot of people might think of community here. In an institutional sense, a lot of people think about community when they say invest, listen, we need to invest in community. They think about community organizations. Um, but I think community exists outside institutions. And unfortunately, um, you know, the systems that oppress us have made it so that community is not is not, doesn't have the same presence, power. And that's the type of work that I'm interesting, interested in doing is building that community that um, I so long for, that I miss from back home. And I think in terms of tackling the issues that concern me or that I work on, it's important to have that community you know, present. And we can't just rely on institutions because a lot of those institutions even though if we invest more in them, they continue to fail a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, whether it be, you know, if you talk about service provision, community organizations do a lot of service provision, but there is a lot of bias within community orgs and a lot of barriers to accessing services. So we need to see beyond, you know, the, you know, what people call the industrial uh, complex of the NGO sector. Mm. And so um, I think it's important for organizers to be building community. And so a lot of the work that I strive to do centers that, whether it be around sexual violence um, and raising awareness, popular education, or whether it be around policing, um, talking to folks and, you know, having conversations on what security is to them, what, you know, what makes them feel safe. And, you know, if we're to in, in the context of the work that I do against policing or, or the work that I do with the coalition to defund the police, if we are to defund the police, we need to have healthy communities. We need to have um, community responses to violence. Mm. But if there's no community, you know, who's going who's gonna to be there to respond? If we don't know who our neighbor is, you know, how are we going to intervene? So I think there's a lot to be reflected on in terms of what community means to each one of us and um, we need to like I would hope that we have a less individualistic um, view of what we view as community and that we do the work and plant the seeds necessary so we can have healthy communities mm -hmm. here in Montreal and and elsewhere and so what what would be the like core elements like if you were to think of a couple of core elements of what community is, is it like space? Is it people? Like what are some of the um, core things that you're looking at that are maybe different than kind of having a bunch of organizations that maybe serve community, but then what is the actual community for you? So like it has changed and evolved in, in the years and in the context of where I do live in Canada. And, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult to know who who lives around you. We live yeah. in a totally different um, system of values. And, you know, back home it was much simpler. Like in terms of policing, like back home nobody calls the police because mm -hmm. everybody knows their neighbors. And if there's a problem, you know, and like during the pandemic, a lot of times we talked about mutual aid. Mutual aid became so important. And I think we were onto something. <laughs> I hope maybe, maybe I hope it continues. But like mutual aid, like in in the Caribbean and in, in the country, the countries where I've lived, it's something that's integrated in our values. Like just recently, there was a hurricane that passed, and I called my mom and like, oh, I'm okay. My the neighbor bought me 
food. Oh, like they have electricity. I don't. So I gave them my food so they could like they there's that, you know, care. Mm -hmm. We care for one another and we don't necessarily always like each other <laughs> because, you know, I know that you my mom has a little tension with your but neighbor. It, it doesn't I. even matter. Like mm -hmm. you can have beef with your neighbor, but you know who your neighbor is. And if there's need or, you know, you, you there is that there aren't those barriers. You can really um, reach out and people reach out to each other, even though they might not necessarily. It's like fa it's like an extension of family. Like mm -hmm. we don't always like all our family. Yeah. Was, and we don't always spend a lot of time with our family. <laughs> but if you see someone that, you know, needs help, it's not like we don't call, you know, there's a system of care that's present. And when that system of care is not enough, that's when we go out to institutions and that's when we go out but there is that like system of care mm -hmm. that is there. And that's something that's missing here, I find, in our communities. Um, and that's something that I think it's important to um, develop if we're going to really tackle the issues like at hand and social social problems that affect our communities. And so when you know, if we expand that and start thinking about black community health. So what does what would black community health mean for you? Um, in this particular context where we know that a when we're talking about black community we're talking about a very diverse you know like plural of what black communities is um, and also that you know geographically we're kind of spread around the city or the country in different places we have language barriers we have isolation we have all of these other things so when when you're thinking about black community health like what are some of the things that you're thinking about in this context there need to be, I think there needs to be spaces to develop sense of community within black communities. Um, we do have a, a couple of community orgs, historical community orgs that continue to do important work. I think we need more. I, need, I think we need to invest more in those that already exist. Um, I think we need to invest in black centered education. I think we need to invest in black centered mental health. Um, you know, a lot of people will be critical and say, oh, you know, uh, here we don't do those uh, divisions. You know, <laughs> our services are for everyone, but the, you know, we see that it's not the case. So, you know, the service, social services, health services aren't for everyone. And a lot of black folks face discrimination, bias when they go to the doctor, when they go um, to the psychologist, when they go to school. So we need, um, we need, we need organizations to support and accompany folks. We need organizations to support and accompany folks, um, our elders, for example. Yeah, for sure. But we also need resources. So like I said before, there is a baseline where we can um, be there for one, for one another. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is difficult because we're spread out and you know, it's, there's not necessarily big pockets of you know, neighborhoods where a lot of us all live. But, you know, we need to find ways in which we can care for one another and, you know, fight for organizations, you know, community organizations that can advocate and have resources to accompany folks that, you know, need support. Mm -hmm. um, you, what you said earlier about how, you know, there is this argument of like, oh, well, we don't divide things here or like we don't see color here or we don't whatever the, the narrative is. Um, I think that. Uh, often that's like kind of the the rebuttal, but there's uh, without acknowledging that there's really significant social disparities um, that impact our communities in in ways that it really doesn't impact other communities or in ways that may be different than other communities. In the work that you do, whether that be around um, police violence, sexual violence, and so on and so forth, um, where do you see these disparities happening? Like, what ways do you find that the um, black community has really different experiences than other oh, communities? everywhere. <laughs> like, in terms of, of children, their first experience of racial profiling is in schools. Mm. And you, like, there's groups on social media of black mothers where they, sh they share their experiences, and they're horrible. You know, you hear... You hear all these experiences kids have, black kids have in schools, how they're over disciplined, how they're punished um, more than their peers, um, how they're, you know, policed more. And um, also the, the lack of services that are available um, 
you know, a lot of, uh, of our kids with, you know, disabilities or challenges and, and learning don't have any resources or there's no programming to accompany these kids and support them in learning. And so what happens is, you know, our um, dropout, dropout rates are much, much more higher. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in the context of children that have disabilities, when they're in closed classrooms, they end up finishing not even finishing, but, you know, ha having, they end up being 18 and there's like nothing. There's, they just age out of school mm -hmm. without a diploma, without any, you know, plan for the future. And then they're in the streets. Mm -hmm. And then we can't be surprised if, you know, there's social problems that affect our communities after. Um, we can't be surprised if, you know, kids get into trouble if there's no programs to address and support their needs. And so that's just schools. If you go to health, you know, I have to tell people in my community, especially elders, if you go to the doctor, try to go with somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, always be accompanied. Like you shared with me once your experience when you were um, in labor, you know, mm -hmm. just women, black women giving birth in hospitals here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the dangers and the vulnerabilities they face and in, in hospitals, you know, in the in the health system, and so it, there's it's 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 everywhere. Like, yeah, for sure. No, and I, you know, this this idea of like the buddy system has literally come up in every single interview I've done this um, this week of like how we are constantly as Black people having to go into spaces with another community member in order for us to be hopeful that we won't have a horrific experience right so like that is not it's not just like oh you know have a buddy so that you can remember the information etc it's like you bring a, a buddy for safety um and i'm and i'm really uh, it's 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 interesting because it it look, touches on the work that i'm looking at in terms of caregiving and and how much of extra labor we end up having to, to take on because we often have to be that advocate for another friend an elder uh you know a sibling and so on and so forth while we're also still experiencing um this violence ourselves and still trying to work it out and still don't have the full answers and etc but yet we have to go and be an advocate for someone else um can you talk a little bit more about the work that you're doing in terms of defund the police um in schools because i think that that's such a important um first space where our children are learning that they're black in a very different way that they might be learning that they're black in homes right um and having to then think about their wellness in really um racialized ways so um the coalition has the coalition to defund the police has different committees and one of them is they call some police and there's youth there's teachers there's organizers that have been organizing within this committee since the beginning of defund and recently, last week, the government announced, the city announced uh, with the SPVM $4 million to um, fund a program, Equipe uh, Ecole, which is a, like a, they call a multidisciplinary Equipe, uh, um, how do you say Equipe? Team. Team, mm -hmm. where you have uh, criminologists, you have police officers, and other and they're going to be going into schools, um, schools where they say there's violence. And what they've said is that it's going to be like on a voluntary basis, like the, the schools have to call them and th then they'll mobilize. But the thing is, you have to look at schools here. You have to they're talking about going to schools where, you know, there's issues and it's mostly um, schools in very racialized neighborhoods. And so if you go to those schools in very racialized neighborhoods, whether it be the English school board or the French um, Centre de Service uh, Scolaire, mm -hmm. um, I've, like my kid has gone to over four schools, maybe four or five schools, and it's always the same thing. The teachers are overwhelming, like the majority are white. And there's like, I don't think my, I, I think my, my son has had one black teacher and he was lucky, <laughs> one Haitian black teacher, but the rest have all been white. And so a lot of, you know, t unfortunately teachers come with biases. They don't know 
necessarily how to address um, you know the 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 challenges that our kids face in in schools necessarily and then you have the fact that the direction of the schools is almost always white mm -hmm. so you can't you know I don't think parents can be very um, comfortable thinking that the first reflex of the school principal or the direction or a teacher is going to be, I think we should call the police. Because they, unfortunately, they don't understand the needs and the challenges our kids face. And since there's an, schools are underfunded, teachers are underpaid, there's a lack of resources, it doesn't give them much options but mm -hmm. to call the police if there's conflict or a case of violence. So we're mobilizing because a lot of parents don't even know that this program is being deployed. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're mobilizing within different communities here in Montreal and different neighborhoods to raise awareness on what this pro pro program means um, and also to look for alternatives like programming around transformative justice, restorative justice. There's a lot of um, schools um, outside of Quebec that have these types of programs to address violence um, within youth in the schools. Mm -hmm. So why can't we fund these types of programs instead of funding, uh, you know, more police officers and in schools? Mm -hmm. You know, schools should be a place of learning, a place where kids feel safe. So the team is, the Ecole Sans Police is doing a lot of work, raising awareness and um, mobilizing folks around this issue. Mm. I appreciate the the lens that you're bringing to to the table right now because one of the so we had a um, like a public conversation yesterday where we were stopping people that were walking up um, down the street and asking them you know what does health and wellness mean for you and, and so on and so forth and one of the people that we uh, chatted with was saying that you know feeling safe and valued in spaces is a, is a form of wellness for me right it's not um, I think that often when we say the word health, automatically we think about the biological aspect or sometimes now a little bit more of the mental aspect because that's been um, like mental health has been at the forefront in a lot of different ways. But we also don't think about, you know, what does it mean to like even feel socially accepted to know that you can go to school safely and so on and so forth. Um, if you were thinking about, you know, wellness, like I know you have a school school aged child um, and and. And the types of spaces that, like, as soon as they leave our home, you know, we have, like, our, I mean, I have a sense of heightened anxiety because, we, like, I know what that can mean for them, right? And so when you think about um, Black community health in these types of spaces, what are you, what are you hoping for, um, for your children or for, and for yourself? So I think if we're to talk about Black health or Black community health, we, we've, you know, we need to get folks to acknowledge that racism, that, you know, policing, surveillance, all of this has a huge impact on health. Like, but it's not been acknowledged. You know, a lot of folks in our communities are sick, not mm -hmm. just in terms of mental health, but physically sick, high blood pressure, diabetes. Alzheimer's, you know, it's just all kinds of black stuff. folks that do, like black folks in medicine that do these studies and do research on this. It's been studied and folks have said in the medical sector that it has a huge impact. But, you know, our, our society doesn't really acknowledge that yet. So and I find that even when they do, they, play, they put the, the responsibility on, on race, us. right? It's like, it's race, not racism that caused the issues. Um, as, as if, like, we were just naturally predisposed yeah. to all of these um, concerns and that there's no social context to, mm -hmm. to be creating these, uh, well, yeah, this disparity. Cancer, like, mm -hmm. there's certain cancers that black women are much more susceptible to having. And so they don't make the connections. And so I think that's, I think it's connected. So for me, it's, it's connected and we need, if we don't target these social issues that affect our communities, you know, if we don't target the, the racism that affects our community, the policing, the surveillance, it's, it's gonna continue having an impact on our, on our, on, on our physical health, on our mental health, on our community, on community health. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Um, so, you know, over the last, well, I don't know, let's say two, three years, whatnot, there's been a resurgence of 
racial awakening. And I say resurgence because we know these things are cyclical and then, you know, people get tired of talking about black people and then it comes back every, every decade or so. Um, so this last resurgence of black, of racial awakening, has it shifted things in a way that you find are significant? Um, are there like initiatives that you're really excited about? Do you feel like we've moved forward? Um, where, where was your, you know, if you had like a pulse check of how things are going, where, where do you, how do you feel about it right now? Honestly, I don't like, I, I cause a lot of people talk a lot about before George Floyd, mm -hmm. after George Floyd, mm -hmm. like, and I understand, you know, there's a lot of programming that has come out, you know, after post uh, George Floyd and uh, organizations that have released funds for black programming and everything. But for folks like you and me that, do, that have been doing this work for our, all of our lives, it doesn't, doesn't really, sometimes I ask myself, does it change things for white folks? Because they have more like spaces now to talk about the issue. Mm. But for folks that are doing the work, like I can't really say that it's changed much in terms of my, the work that I do or how I do it because and even and sometimes it's even counterproductive because sometimes it's just so performative that mm -hmm. you know whether it be in you know and I know indigenous folks face the same you know there's certain gains in terms of acknowledgments from our governments but a lot of times it just leads to a lot of performance and performativity and not real lasting change, mm -hmm. transformative change. And that's what worries me. Like I need to see the transformation before I, I buy the whole Jump like. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I feel, you know, well, cause they give us, they give, they'll give us money, but then they're going to say they're going to put police in, 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 the, in schools, the schools, you know, a little, a little bit of balance. You can, yeah. you can't have too much transformative change at the same time. You know, you got to balance it out. Um, you know what I think one of the things that I find is interesting about these shifts whenever they happen is that um, I think it has more of an impact on popular education than it has an impact on institutions and systems, um, which for the most part, I think, continue kind of doing um, either performative work or, you know, the cogs are still kind of like, you know, very much lacking oil and are not moving as, as quickly as I would like to see it. But what I do see sometimes, though, is that um, it'll give a burst in terms of general understanding, right? So even when we were doing this like Vox Pop on the street and asking people about concerns in terms of like that community and so on, there was more people than I think I would have encountered before who were able to even formulate a thought about what they think is happening to black communities than say if I had had this conversation with people on the street five years ago where they wouldn't even um, like they wouldn't even necessarily cross their mind and so then I also I wonder and I'm and I'm asking you this if you find that if we elevate like the general population's education around this thing the, around our concerns and so on and so forth do you find that that then trickles into your work down the line like does that actually is that enough so you have to remember we're talking about a society here in Quebec that the government can't even acknowledge that there's racist, <laughs> systemic racism. So I'm still waiting for the conversation to, you know, no, rise to a, to a, rise a middle, to a, a baseline, a, a baseline <laughs> level. So that's why I say, like, in the context of, you know, in terms of Canada as a whole, yes. But in terms of where we live in mm. Quebec, I mm -hmm. think there's so much work to be done still. And so I can't depend on on them to get their shit together. Mm -hmm. You know, we still have to do the work we have to do for our community. And yeah. so I, I think that's where we rely on allies to do work because a lot of times it's just, you know. And it's also, it's very exhausting, non-productive non work. Like that, I think that that's one of the things that I have come out of the last two, three years of my life just being like, I can't, I can't do hamster wheel work. Like that's, that's just, it's not good for my own health. It's not good for my family health. And like, if we're going to do um, any sort of change, I'd rather see it on a, like be slow, but consistent and actually long-term versus they kind of like, 
being um, very showy, but then not not sustainable. Yeah, and also the it's it's tricky because a lot of times you know government is coming out with policies that are detrimental to our community, actions that are detrimental to our communities. They just say really racist things, like just last. This week, or was it, where the ex-minister of uh, immigration talked about migrants here, that, mm-hmm. you know, that they don't work and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, a lot of us are very in a reactionary mode, like, we need to react to this, we need to react to this policy, we need, like, we're always reacting to something. And that doesn't <laughs> give us the time to create what we really want to see for our communities. And so that's why I think there needs to be a balance I'm really glad that there's folks that, you know, there's folks that just say, I can't even be in the reaction because that my mental health is, it affects my mental health too much. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to be in my space trying to create what I want for my community. And I see a lot of folks doing that. And I think that's, that's really important because if not, you're always, I remember when I was younger, I was always reacting. And I, I was think always the- mad. <laughs> and I'm going to go out, okay, no, we need to do it. And we still need to go out in the streets. We still need to take the streets. Oh, for sure. But we need to have energy also to build those systems that we want to replace the yeah. ones. Well, that's the thing, right? Like, there's so many levels to this, this work. And, and everyone, I think that um, there's so many different types of roles. Some of them are front line. Some of them are kind of like in the background and et cetera. And I think that there was a time when people were talking about it as if it was like personalities, right? Like you're a firecracker, so you're going to be a front line person and so on and so forth. But what I like in what you're saying is that like often it's, it's like, um, it's almost like a rite of passage. Like we all have a responsibility in many of these different roles. And if we don't rotate, if we don't, um, have a system where we, all feel invested in the multiple um, aspects of this work, then we're really just burning out the very um, small resources we have, right? Yeah. Like the small people resources we have, because especially in this context, as we know, we are a, a minority, we're spread out, we're isolated, we're so on and so forth. So you, at, a, at the end of the day, sometimes you'll see the same 15 names doing the, the work over like 15 years, yeah. and that's, not, um, that's definitely not gonna allow us to have longevity. Like, I've, I've come to understand that there's different ways of showing up for your community, but I think, like, even if with the age I've become less active in certain act, forms of action, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to show up, you mm-hmm. know, for those actions because, you know, I think it's important that we value how everyone shows, can show up. And I think it also has to do with our talents. We have to put into, you know, we have to use our talents and not everybody has the same talents. So it's normal that, like, for artists, the artists that use their talents to raise awareness. Like, there's a lot of um, black artists here in the city that are doing incredible work and, you know, transformative work. And we need to support that. And I'm not, like, I don't have those skills, but (laughs) I can support it. You're not going to sing for us right now? (laughs) So uh, yeah, I think it's important to uh, to show. It's important to show up for our communities in different ways, in the ways that we can. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know that advocacy doesn't always just happen from our communities, right? So like, you touched on allies for a little moment, and allies can be from multiple different communities, um, other racialized communities, uh, other minority communities, white communities, and so on and so forth. When you're thinking about community advocacy um, and people who are entering in conversation with Black community health, what would be some of the things that you would want them to know about our Black communities um, before they they start working with us? Well, that's a tricky question. So, like for me, I used to do a lot of coalition work. And I still do, like in the context of the coalition to defend, but I think that's the only coalition work that I do right now in terms of um, the work that I do, because for me, it was very, very exhausting in the sense that doing coalition works, the needs and the experiences of black folks usually Mm. went to the bottom of, in terms of priorities. Mm -hmm. And I got tired of having to fight for, to center the needs of black folks. So, you know, at the end, I just, decided that I was going to concentrate my efforts and my talents for my community. And that doesn't mean that you don't do coalition work sometimes. You do. 
but my focus is for my community. And so, and I think there's ways that people can support without, you know, because the problem is a lot of times it takes a lot of energy to always be, sometimes you have to like walk them, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, you know, it's very, how, do, how can I help? Like the, the famous question in, all, in every panel. Mm. So, you know, I want to be an ally. What can I do, I do to help? help? And mm-hmm. it's a very like, it's, it puts uh, the, the responsibility on, on, on mm-hmm. us. So mm-hmm. I think that needs to change. We need to find ways of working with each other and doing coalition work where the burden and the work, most of the work doesn't fall on, on us. Well, you know what's uh, also so interesting about those questions is that it's with an assumption that we actually understand the systems that they're coming from. So often when people would ask me like, well, wait, what can I do as an ally? I'm like, well, I don't actually know your organization as well as you do. So like you could tell me what what like can be done because you actually know the system that you're working in. You know your community really well. You know your organization well and so on and so but forth. But sometimes it's individuals mm-hmm. that they just stand up with the best of intentions. Yeah, for sure. And they say like, because they but that maybe they have an awakening and they say, oh, my God, we're <laughs> participants in this, you know? Yeah. And they're like, what can I do? But sometimes they stay in that, what can I do? You need to tell me what to do, you know? And it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot of times it's a lot. No, for sure. Um, and as if there isn't other ways for people to get educated. Like start with your family. Oh, my That's... gosh. Literally. And I mean that like families is a big part, right? You know, I when think we you talk, need to right? start with your community because a lot of times. The main cons- the com- complaint, a lot of times people from that are not from our communities that want to be in solidarity, they want to just dive into our communities. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's a lot of work. But then when there's work to be done outside with, you know, non-black communities, they're not necessarily the ones that are the most vocal. Oh, for sure. And so I think you need to start with your own community. And it takes a different type of bravery to show up to... Um, black spaces, and I know that it takes like a bravery to do that, right? Versus to Does speak it? up to, sometimes, you know, for some people, but then, and it's a very different type of um, like awareness and bravery and, and all of the above to do that in your own community, right? And to be accountable and then to, to then become, I had a friend who, um, I have a friend who's an ally and, um, and they've t- told me a lot about like how the shift of, um, of their relationships happen when they started to speak for minority people in in those in those spaces in their community, right? And then they then got pegged as the person who cares about minority people, and so conversations change, your friendships change, um, people look at you differently, and et cetera, et cetera. And I think a lot of people are very afraid to take that on, right? Afraid to be like, oh well, not, like everyone's gonna, <laughs> you know? And yeah, it's like, but, but that that's say that they're exactly, and that's that's really. I think that where the discomfort is is where actually the allyship begins, right? Because you can't you can't be like I'm an ally as long as it's like very cushy and very nice, and no one's gonna say that it's like um, you know no one's gonna question me, no one's gonna, you know like that. I feel like that's the 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 leap that people are afraid to make without you know acknowledging that this this momentary discomfort that you're having we have like it's our it's like literally the framework of our lives here, right? So. Um, yeah. And now rever- on the reverse, if you were to think about what you would want black community members to know about community organizations, to know about um, community advocates, about community, what, what do you want our community to start thinking through and um, have at the forefront of their, their mind in terms of getting their needs fulfilled? I just think as, you know, as black folk, we need to better value the work that our community community members do because we have an idea, this idea of what <clears throat> what is a community act, activist or what is a community organizer or who's doing this work. And there's so many people, like so many people, doing important work. It's just they don't really. It's not really valued or or visible. But you know, you know especially black women, mm-hmm. black women, all the labor that they do daily with, you know, their families, with their community members, which is not, which is not just, 
which is ignored. And so I think we need to start valuing um, community and community work. And we, we need to start looking at, looking at it differently. It can't just be um, the work that is visible, you know, the folks that are on TV or the mm -hmm. folks that are doing conferences. It has to be also like we need to protect and we need to value those that are doing the work that's invisible, the work that, you know, nobody writes about, that mm -hmm. nobody sees, but that is doing a very, you know, that's making change and, it, you know, making a difference in the lives of our community members daily. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would like to. I love that because it's, it's, there's so many things that I hear when, you, when I hear you say that. So one, I hear like the valuing of our community members, um, which I think also like uh, helps with the burnout that we're seeing from our black women and so on and so forth. Like there's a, when you value, you also invest and you also care for and, you, and so on and so forth. So that's one level. Um, another thing that I see, what I hear is this idea of um, longevity of what is being done, right? So if we actually valued, let's say, the ways in which our black community members um, are mothering, are doing elder care and et cetera, et cetera, then we can build on it, right? And see it as, as important, right? As opposed to kind of, I think that there's this, um, like there's, there's almost like a, a lack of acknowledgement that we're doing very intentional work. Like when we raise our children to be um, strong and love themselves and um, care for themselves in non-black spaces, that's intentional work. It's not just like I'm a good mom. It's not like it's like, no, like I really have to think about this on a day to day basis. Like, how am I going to best equip this child in this world? For them to be able to, to to survive, to thrive, right? I'm gonna undo all the damage that's been on a done daily basis, school. right? And and that is for me, that's a theory. Like, don't don't tell me that that's just like I woke up like this and I like you know like I there's a lot of theories, practices, and so on and so forth that are 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 almost like are completely unseen, really, at the end of the day, right? Like, what amazing radical work is happening there when we um, do that for our children, when we think about our elders, when we think about our sisters, our our men, and all of these things that we um, do on a daily day basis that doesn't get valued as star activism, that doesn't get seen as a framework, doesn't you know what I mean? And how could we then invest in it in a way that actually is um is a framework that can be passed on from generation to generation and we're not like all starting from from jump you know so in one of the past interviews that we had this week we were talking about um you know birth workers and supporting supporting black birthers in in like health institutions and so on and it's like do we have to reinvent the wheel each time that somebody's supporting or can we actually value that and be like actually the way in which black birth workers have been doing this for generations is actually really important and that should be part of our kind of community knowledge um yeah, so I really appreciate you kind of bringing that to the forefront. And it's a nice segue to start to talk about um, the many different ways in which I know that you do to caregiving. And, and I'd love to talk, talk about, you know, as a caregiver for many <laughs> different, different contexts, right? Whether that be in your personal family or in community and so on. Um, how do you fill yourself up as a caregiver? Do you find that you have a community of care that checks up on you as well? Or is it... Are you kind of in this, um, uh, you know, ex extractive relationships with care where often you're caring for others and, that, and that's not necessarily being reciprocated? So I guess what I would say is when I started, when I moved here and I started getting involved and, you know, started doing, you know, rallies, uh, being like doing visible work. I quickly, I quickly realized that I needed to protect myself having a solid uh, group of community, what you know, I consider my community around me that know me and love me beyond me being an organizer or the work that I do and then know me, you know, because a lot of the, you know, I was talking to a youth the other day um, and we were talking about the importance of, you know, 
being an activist, being an organizer, that can't be your sole identity. You know, that's mm-hmm. something you do because you believe in something. You're trying to create change, and you believe in that change. But that can't be your that can't be your identity. You know, and you can't let people just appreciate you just because of the work that you do. And so for, I'm very intentional of surrounding myself with people who don't care. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, you were on TV? I wore a bet. <laughs> <laughs> don't care at all and I'm like my, my like my kid my kid does not care mm-hmm. I, you know oh, I mean this, this, this is why we have children so they can keep us humble you know like you out here you thought like oh I went to this conference they come back and they're like get where my snack at <laughs> <laughs> or you know like I'm very intentional the people closest to me are people that either knew me before I was doing this work specifically or even if they knew me after like you don't care. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that like when we spend time together, we can just be us and talk about other stuff besides the struggle because that's that's community care. We can't just mm-hmm. always be thinking and in, in that type of mode because we're going to burn out. We're going to we're not going to be we're not going to be able to take care of our health. So it's important, you know, to also value our being outside of you know that you know the public figure or the organizer or you know it can't just be that it Mm -hmm. it has to be also about you know about us yeah for sure and this and you know i I really feel like again it kind of echoes what you're talking about in terms of how we see community like a, a community in this north american context is often synonymous with community organizing rather than the actual people you know like we both you know as hispano hablantes when you say pueblo you're not just talking about like Pueblo, the, the structure, right? You're talking about Pueblo, like people. Yeah. Like, so it's really about your people. And um, and I think that that very much gets lost in a context where we're constantly fighting for rights. And I can understand why the structure takes a forefront in a lot of different ways. But um, remembering to not to, to not lose ourselves in that, right? And, and why are we even doing the work at the end of the day, and right? And it's kind of, you know... Like I've said this before, and a lot of times people are surprised, and it's because it is disappointing in the sense that if we there if there is a community of organizers, we should be you know looking for out for each other. But it's not always the case because everybody you know it's it's difficult. We live in a society where it's difficult to have community, and so that from the start, and then. When you're surrounded, when the work that you do is visible, there's a lot of stuff that comes with that. Mm-hmm. And it's, so it's hard to, it's even counterproductive to having or nurturing that sense of community. And so while there are, like, I'm not saying there aren't any people I organize with that I consider part of my community, there are, but like the vast majority are people that like know me to the core and know me and know that that, like the fact that I organize or the work that I do is like a small part Mm -hmm. of who I am, which is important, but is not all that I am. Mm -hmm. And because I think that's important because I've heard so many stories of black women who are organizers or who were like leaders in their community and once they stop organizing because of health because this you know straight up this like can kill you um they're forgotten they're forgotten mm. they're forgotten and you know there's GoFundMe's to raise money for this and for that because they're just forgotten yeah and so that's what like really opened my eyes and i think it's an, it's important specifically for black women because a lot of the work that are, that we do is is a uh, you know i think sometimes the 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 work is is ungrateful you know oh it is the most ungrateful <laughs> and so and so i think it's important that we we have a, a like a community net that is there even if we can't do the work because mm-hmm. it can't you know i think it's it's not fair that we only show up when you know when the work is visible, when we can do the work, because we're not going to be always. And the point is not to be always doing the like. The point is to have, you know. You I'm know, all about come, passing the torch. Yeah. Always, always. So when it. we pass the torch, does that mean that 
nobody's gonna care for us? Oh, true. I mean, I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, I would say yes. I would say, at least in my experience, you know, in, when I think about the many times I have passed the torch, because that's kind of my own health practice is to. I usually like. I'm a little bit of like. I, I have a lot of that startup energy, and I'll help when things are like urgent and and get that going. And then I have to pull out because once I, you know, it's not a sustainable for me. Um, but then I get forgotten for sure. You know, I get forgotten. I've had to change completely different communities of um, of connaissance, really, because I wouldn't say that they're like meaningful relationships because they didn't make it from one um, side of me to the next side of me. And yeah, no, it's really, and I've seen it happen, like you said, very much so, particularly to black women, um, that unless they're useful, they're no longer part of who we check in with, who we hang out with, um, don't get invited, and so on and so forth. It's only really when they're, um, they're able to kind of give in a very specific way. Um, I've, I also wanted to talk about how we learn to be caregivers. And I know a lot of the time it's, it's literally just out of necessity. Like I, I know that like part of how I learned how to be a caregiver for a child is because I had one, my mom, is because she's aging. Like, you know what I mean? Like those things we kind of learn in, in, the, um, in the thick of it. But, you know, in an ideal world, like what, how would you like to see this knowledge transfer be happening, right? Like, is it, um, I know that's like a bit of a push towards, I don't know if I have an issue with it, but I know that it's sometimes I, I get, um, like I have a difficult relationship with money. And, and though I know particularly living in this North American context, we need money, but I do see that um, there's a packaging, I wouldn't say commercialization, but a packaging of our knowledges as things that are exchanged with in terms of money, right? So like, whether that be trainings of like this and that, and it's like, and it's for our own community members often, right? Of like how to do, I don't know what X, Y, or Z, like social justice, whatever the training is. And we're teaching each other on things that really at the end of the day belong to us and have belonged to us, but unfortunately got lost in translation. And then, so we package to each, it's to each other for a fee. And I can understand, you know, it's like this is like the person is an entrepreneur and this is how they make money. I get that. Um, but often I feel like that's it's it's happening as like the main way to do knowledge transfer. And I don't necessarily see as many other forms of just like natural community mentorship or. Um, yeah, like the different ways in which this would happen if we were in Haiti or in Cuba or in, um, you know what I mean? Like where, pe where knowledge would be transferred literally because you're like, you're following them around. And so you see them do these different types of things. So in, in your ideal world, how would these, um, how would we be learning about these, these ways in which we, we live in this particular world? <laughs> is that the last question? Because that's a, a big one. question. That's a heavy one. I threw, I threw it on. You should have put it at the my beginning job. or in the middle, not at the end. <laughs> um, it's really difficult because, you know, I'm Cuban. <laughs> so that's like a lot of uh, things to unpack. Like for me, it was very, very, it was a shock um, because the work that, like when I be, I started organizing very young, like in 16, 17 years old, then university, you know, I did my university in Puerto Rico. We were fighting to get the Marines out of the island. You know, we were doing civil disobedience. Nobody got paid for anything. Mm -hmm. And then I left, I came here. And at the beginning we would do panels. Nobody would get paid for doing panels. But then there was a sense that, you know, that a lot of times nobody i said nobody that's not true mm. black black women wouldn't get paid yeah, yeah. <laughs> bottom of the food but chain. like a lot of times i saw that there was you know in this context other people would get paid but then you know when people got started getting um interested around intersectionality and wanted to hear about black feminism and you know it was like trendy black women would start getting invited to talk here and talk there and so, and they weren't being paid necessarily. And so 
I think there was uh, an awareness that, you know, in the context, in the to- context where we live today, and especially when it's not, this is not for community, you know, when we're yeah, being yeah, invited, exactly. it's like the university or, uh, you know, someone's classroom or mm-hmm. uh, a, a community org that's not our, from yeah, our not community. Our people, for sure. So I think it's really important to, 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 um, to pay for one's labor mm-hmm. and i think it's a form of reparation too so yeah 100%. i don't i don't have an issue with with that um i just think we need to have conversations on what type of work you know like when we're doing a lot of times and i think that's something very personal too i like i don't know how to answer this question because i don't want to I don't but want it doesn't to say have what to be others like should one do. Format. Me, me yeah. personally, I do things free for my community. Mm-hmm. Like for my, if, especially if I know there's no budget, like yeah. I'm not gonna. Oh, I'm not gonna do it because you don't, you know. But you know what? I think it also it ties into this idea of what community is in the first place, right? Because if if we're saying we're doing it, let's say we're using your framework and it's like we're doing it for a community because that is free. But is it like is it like a community org that got a bunch of funding to, to do say, this thing versus yeah, is that's it what community, I'm saying. community? If there's no budget, uh-huh. because I think the thing is people are used to seeing black women not get paid and yeah. it's become normalized. And yeah. so it's like, oh, like even if there's a budget, oh, you're black, you're a black woman. So it shouldn't be a thing. And yeah, that's yeah. like, no. Mm-hmm that shouldn't be a thing and we should pay for people's work especially because like i said it's different it's tricky for me because i came here as an adult i was not born here i was not raised here and so i know that you know culturally and in terms of the system that we live in people need to get paid for their labor it's you know it's it's a value system there's there's a value system in that and and i like i don't have a problem with that it's just the com- commodification of social justice, the commodification of liberation movements. That's what I have a problem with. And it's, and in, and it's also taking a very specific formula, format, let's say. At least that's what I've been noticing. So I think about how I grew up and how I, because I was born and raised here, you know, I wasn't in the Caribbean, and how I grew up and how... Um, like community activism, not social activism, but like very community activism um, was passed down to me was literally because in my dining room, my mom was always having meetings with all her people. <laughs> they were right, like they were there, you know what I mean? Like, so I learned like on Babush, you know, just like literally cause you're there and you happen to be in the space or she'd take me to the radio station with her or there's the, like all of that. And then my aunts would do that and my uncles would do that. And, and, and you know, we have a very fluid understanding of what aunts and uncles means, right? And so there's, there was a lot of knowledge transfer that was happening just by being in these spaces and not this like formulated labor format of like I'm going to create this training you are going to take this training um, or you're going to come to this talk or you're going to do this and etc and that that is something that can be commodified in a really different type of way you know but I see this happening this so I guess the way to answer this question now that kind of in my head is that that is in the context of uh like what we call the in nonprofit industrial complex. <laughs> yes, complex. Yes. I mean, you see, you see how I use big words. Ah, you got it. <laughs> because you know, we live in a in a in a context. We live in a society, neoliberal society, capitalist society, where everything like social needs, health needs is commodified, mm-hmm. and so we have community organizations where people, you know the work that they do in this community in community organization is often professionalized now you have to be like social worker you have to be this so it's not really so that's what i'm saying when we say community well what are we really talking about mm-hmm. who's part of that community because there's for me these are institutions yes that, you know it's the institutionalization of community work yes 100%. and so people are paid to do that work and then you're bringing other people to do work and they should be paid and they too. They should be paid too because they're part. So, of this in the context yes. of community organizations, that's what I'm saying. If they have a budget, they should be paying people for their labor, even 100%. if it's like a anti-racism training uh-huh. or if it's a whatever training it is, even if it's a black community organization. Yeah, for sure. 
because they're getting, you know, they're in that system. Where I have an issue is where that, you know, extends to liberation movements and nothing can be done outside, outside of, of that, that framework. Yes. yes. And That's I, where I find that mm -hmm. there's a danger because, you know, it's the commodification of our liberation movements. And yeah. That's, yeah, for that's sure. Really and, then it, and then it also pinpoints very specific experts. And we know, like, that this will then be the star activists. Um, often it'll be our males. Often, you know what I mean? There's a lot of um, things that happen when we do this, like, prefer, like professionalization of, like, very grassroots um, like, you know, in your kitchen kind of work, <laughs> as soon as it leaves the kitchen, it's a very different person that they put to the face of that. Um, but there's still f folks that are working outside of that framework. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that's one of the dangers. Um, because when I came here, I worked in collect, you know, I've organized with BLM here in Montreal. Mm -hmm. I've organized with other anti-racist collectives. Um, I've organized with feminists. Um, and, and not been like not in a, in a context where it's an organization and you mm -hmm. have people that are um, staff and, you know, are workers. No, it's like we're all organizers mm -hmm. and we do this like without being paid on top of all the other responsibilities. Exactly. But, you know, I don't see it like we need if we need resources, I would say. It's often because we need to feed people, mm -hmm. because we need to help people, mm -hmm. because we need to get people out of jail, because we need to pay lawyers. That's why we need money. But I don't see, uh, like, in terms of that type of work, I don't, because it's not a community organization. It's, yeah. like, organizers that, you know, um, are doing this important work. I fear that there's going to be like a professionalization and then it's going to be like commodified and then nobody's not going to, nobody's going to want to do anything if it's not in the, in, in this framework. And then context. also even just like when it comes to getting grants and whatnot, well, how long has your, your organization been around and how, you know, all these things that kind of create, um, yeah, like you said, this like industrialization of our, of our, of our social justice movement. And, but what ends up happening through the prof prof professionalization is that, the folks like if it was a collective before and it then becomes a community org is they get even further away from the from the from the i mean the community they serve at the end of the day really you're such a wise one mm -hmm. <laughs> are you sure <laughs> yes i am i'm 100 percent sure um how do people stay in touch with you uh i want to know what's the the best way social media online i know you have a website can you tell people a little bit of how they can stay connected with your work so i have an office um here on campus here on campus concordia zone marlene lopez <laughs> 2155 mm -hmm. Guy street at the simone de Beauvoir institute um you can look me up on concordia website i have my emails there and lots of pretty pictures or if not you'll see me on the streets <laughs> You'll, yeah, see, you'll always see me on the streets. Yeah, when, you're you're not, the streets. When, when you don't see me on the streets, be worried. Be worried. Be worried. Look for her. Look for her. Don't let her be forgotten, everybody. Thank you so much for chatting with us today. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, um, I guess I'll just take a note. Uh, I'll take a moment, excuse me, to, to make a note to say it's it's pretty impressive for us here at Force Space to give people two semi-comfortable chairs and a couple of mics and maybe a little tidy glass of water and see how the conversation sort of evolves. And um, we've certainly witnessed that this week with you and Yik and the folks that you've brought in. It's It's been tremendous and I'm so excited that we've been able to work together to make this happen and to have these conversations live on for others to experience them down the line. So thank you so much. Marlene for coming in and Anik for being here with us daily this week and, and making all of this come, come, come to life, really. Um, folks, thank you for joining us on Zoom. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. And if you'd like to revisit anything that happened this week, just go to Concordia University's Fourth Space YouTube channel and you'll find the streams available there. On that note, we're going to bid you a great afternoon and talk soon. Bye, everybody.
If you have an idea for a podcast, please let us know. You can contact us by email at info4 at concordia.ca or find us on social media at CU Fourth Space. We'd love to hear from you. The Fourth Space podcast is hosted by me, Douglas Moffat, and produced with Anna Vaklebeck. Editing by Chanel Lees Marshall and Maximus Delmar. And our theme music, courtesy of Supercontinent. Thanks for listening.